Um, well, I'm very pleased to be, able to be able to give this little talk on versions of Bruton Town that I collected from singers in Gloucestershire and Bristol in the 1960s. I recorded two versions of the ballad, one under the title The Break of Brass from Lemmy Brazel and her brother Danny Brazel, both members of an extended gypsy traveller family resident in Gloucester that I got to know very well in the 60s right through to the 70s and beyond. And the Fields of Hunting, which is from Mark Stevens of Bristol. Mark was an uncle of Riley Stevens, married to Danny Brazel's daughter. Bruton Town, this is the classic opening stanza from Mrs. Emma Overd of Langport, Somerset, noted by Cecil Sharp in August 1904 and published the following year in the Folk Song Journal. Um, I won't read that, you've seen it. Well, I'll read a little bit. In Bruton Town, there lived a farmer who had two sons and one daughter dear. Both day and night, they were a contriving to fill their parents' heart with fear. Now, it's quite clear immediately that this was a ballad that Francis James Child didn't know and hadn't included and maybe never, I'm sure never came across. I don't think we, we don't think he did. This obviously was quite interesting for everyone. The theme of the ballad was clearly based on the very old tale made famous by Boccaccio in the 14th century as Philomena's story in the Decameron, translated into German verse in a play by Sachs in the, in the 1500s and into a poem by Keats, Isabel and the Pot of Basil that achieved great fame after it was published in 1821. The ballad exists in several versions in the south of England, a number of versions in the south of England and versions in America. The English versions, I think we have about 20 texts and I know of 16 tunes. The locations and ballad titles vary from version to version, from Bruton Town, Bridgewater Town, Strawberry Town, Break of Briars, and the famous farmer. The persona of the ballad are a rich farmer, two or three sons, a daughter, and a servant. The unique motives that are present in the English versions are the girls used for handkerchief to wipe her dead lover's eyes, use of the word break, death of the brothers by hanging, or death of all by poisoning and burial in a single grave. In the American versions, of which there are 20 or more texts and tunes, the locations are varied, Seaport Town, Bridgewater Town, the Prentice Boy, the Bramble Briar, the Bamboo Briar, which is clearly a mishearing, I presume, of Bramble Briar. The persona are completely different from the English versions. They're a rich merchant, two sons, seagoing traders, a daughter and an apprentice. The unique motives are the death of brothers by shipwreck or drowning at sea. So the question is, why are the English and ver American versions have such different persona? We'll look at the three versions, first of all, Emma Overd's version, Lemmy Brazel's version, and Mark Stevens' version. A rich farmer has two sons and a daughter. One son discovers that their servant is courting their sister. He tells his brother the secret. They decide to kill the servant. The servant is taken for a day of hunting. The servant is murdered and his body left in a break in Overs version, or a break of briars in the Brazil version, or a trough of water in the Stevens version. When they return from hunting, their sister asks for her serving man. They reply that they've left him where they've been hunting. She lays in bed and has a dream and her lover speaks to her. He tells her to search the woods to find his body. She finds his body in a break of briars covered over with drops of blood. She takes a handkerchief to wipe his eyes as they could not see and declares that she will lay beside him as she says, to death I'll stay. And that's the end of the ballad in Overd's version. She wipes his eyes and kisses his cheeks and declares her love. And further line to the story in the Brazil's version and the Stevens version continues again. Three days and nights she lays by him until hunger creeps on. She returns home and the brothers are sent for trial and hung in the Stevens version. Or in the Brazil version, she prepares a feast poisons herself and her brothers, and the four are laid in one grave. So here's the break of briars sung by Lemmy Brazel in her caravan beside the River Severn in Gloucester, December 1966. The ballad is sung to a tune of a mixed rhythm of 5-4 and 3-2 in the Mixolydian mode. That's Lemmy, I think we have to see her. Lemmy in her trailer in Gloucester in 1975, photo by Mike Yates, he recorded her about 10 years after I met her, and other members of the Brazel family for Topic. So here's the transcription of her first couple of verses, well, first verse and some alterations and bits and pieces. A match of hunting they provided, and we'll listen to her singing. A match of hunting they provided. They provided on the very same day. 
She said, welcome home, my two own brothers, in what become of my servant man. We left him behind as we'd been a-hunting. It was so dark we could not see. To I hope that the sound is better at your end than it is at mine. Um, this is Emma Overd's version, which I've transcribed in, in, with Sibelius, and this is her, a, a, a MIDI version of the same of her version. When Sharp published it in the when Sharp published it in the Folk Song Journal, he commented that it was a beautiful tune, Dorian scale. In fact, the first stanza is not Dorian. It's, uh, it's got, it hasn't got the third of the, of, the, of the scale. That's the flattened seventh, which is present in both Dorian and Mixolydian. The flattened third only occurs here and here, but in fact, he used this line of tune in all his published versions later in the English book of... Uh, folk songs and in this Somerset collection along with piano accompaniment. Here is uh, just to talk about them. Um, this flattened seventh at the top is not there in Lemmy's opening line but it's present later there but it doesn't rise up to the tonic and come back to the flattened seventh which was rather significant in, in Overwood's version. But what is particularly interesting in Lemmy's version is her 5-4 and the way that rhythm is broken up because the first two parts of that five are broken up into a triplet. So it's one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, six. When it's talked about as five, four and three, two, it's essentially a three, a five, four tune where the last note of the last concert, the last syllable of the, of the line is held, making it not five, four, but three, two. I don't know why that's playing again. <clears throat> right. A few days later, I visited Lemmy again, along with her brother Danny. We discussed the song and asked if she could sing it again. On this, case, on this occasion, she sang it to a tune that was, is known as Lord Bateman, for the tune for Lord Bateman. Cecil Sharp had collected the ballad to that tune as well. The tune is, a, again, a mix of 5, 4 and 3, 2, and 2, 2, in this case, in the Mixolydian mode. As she rose early the next day morning, she searched the woods where the briars grow. In in the valley she found his body all covered over with drops of blood. And now to the version that I collected in, in Bristol. In May 1966, Danny Brazel's son-in-law, Riley Stevens, said, suggested he took me to Bristol to meet his grandfather, Chappie Stevens, and Uncle Mark Stevens, who he knew had songs. This ballad, this, this ballad is sung here by Mark to a remarkable wandering tune that is largely in the Lydian mode recorded in Lull State Bottom in 1966. I've marked with a little circle here the notes that define the tune as either Lydian or major Ionian. In fact, it's variable in this stanza. He's got the sharpened fourth here and there and not there. Here's all for the farmer that did live nigh you had three sons and one daughter dear And a servant man, though she did much mire For hunting all my true love will go In the second stanza those four, three occasions where the, the fourth of the, of the scale is played, is sung, they're all sharp. So this is an entirely Lydian stanza. Lydian is an unusual um, mode, very rare. Sharp was very impressed when he discovered one. I suppose I have been when I discovered this one for that matter. Um, but it, uh, it's unusual because the fourth of the scale is a very structurally important note within a scale. But here's that. For come saddle me, all my milk white pony, 
Like white saddle to me, my milk white steam. For as we may ride through the fields of Antin, for to find the one that have been just destroyed. I've got it transcribed for later stanzas at the end, but I'm not going to play those. We haven't really the time. But as you can see, the fourth of the scale is variable. But most often it's in the sharp. Huh? Now, having found those, I've been interested to find out uh, how they compared with other tunes and texts, for that matter, of the English and, for that matter, the American versions. The 16 tunes collected in England after examination, appear to fall into four main families based on their scale or mode, their meter, range, melodic line, and end of line cadence. Here are the tune, here's the first of them. Bruton Town or Overd, as I'm calling it, Emma's version, Lemmy version, Lemmy's and Danny's version, and Nelson Ridley that was collected by Ewan McCall. He only had a couple of stanzas, but his tune is very much the same tune. Um, it's got uh, five, four, three, two rhythms quite a lot of the time. It's got nine notes in the scale and the at the end notes of the lines uh, finish on the tonic, the fifth, the tonic, and the tonic in all four cases. Another tune family, the Hereford Bridgewater ones, as I'm referring them to, referring to them as uh, the first one that I've got on the list there was collected by Vaughan Williams in 1913. 1913. Ionian, Ionian, all of them, uh, nine notes more or less in the scale. Caroline Hughes, a slightly higher note, making it 10 notes in the scale. Um, three, four, or five, four, all with the third, the fifth, the fifth, and the eighth as the, the notes at the ends of the lines, that is the finishing on the high tonic. Lord Bateman, Whitcomb version, again, the similarity between the Whitcomb and Brazel version. Having looked at the fact that there are families in, in respect of tunes, the question then was, do the texts also remain as part of a family? Now in Overd's, and in this version here, only Emma Overd of the ones that have a tune that we know of uh, had, time, had, the, had the name Bruton Town. Both Lemmy's and Nelson really had no place name mentioned. They all refer to the place where the, where the murder took place as the match of hunting and where the body was placed as the break of briars or briars in the case of Nelson Ridley's. In the Hereford Bridgewater one, the place name is all Bridgewater. And I don't think any other texts have Bridgewater as the place name in English ones. They all have a rather strange verse or line that mentions ploughing the ocean. <clears throat> and they all have reference to the break of briars as the place where the burial takes place. In the Lord Bateman Whitcomb one, those similarities are actually much the same as in the Bruton Town Overd one, a match of hunting and the break of briars. We then have another, the last of the tune families, which I'm referring as Digweed, uh, is the their microphone open. And uh, all of these tunes, they're not so similar as some of them, but they're all Ionian, that is major. They're all 5 4, combinations of 5 4 and 3 2. They have a range of more or less nine notes, one more than the octave. That one's just the octave. And they finish on the fifth, the second, the fifth, and the first. Or in the case of three, of two of them, or three of them, the end of the third line finishes either on the fourth, but then proceeds straight into the fifth. And the Mark Stevens one, it's very similar in many ways, except it's got a bigger range, 10 notes, and it certainly has the, the sharpened fourth. But it also has 5251. I would class that probably as being along into the same family. Now, as regards the texts of the same families, in the digweed one, none of them mention a place name. They all start of a farmer, there was a rich farmer, whatever, you shall hear. You shall hear or live nigh here. And the place where the, where the uh, event takes place, where the young man is tempted to go, is the field of hunting. Where the body is buried is a creek or bushes or a ditch or a trough. In no cases is it a break of briars and the brothers at the end get hung. Well, I think we have to mention the most important person who made a very big study of this in 1918. 
Belden published a detailed study of the 10 versions of the ballad known at that time, four English and four American. He noted that the texts of the ballad were very variable, but he concluded that all were related to some common original based on Boccaccio. But what was that common original? For no printed text was known either in England or America. A recently discovered text titled The Bridgewater Merchant in a Family Manuscript in New York State has thrown new light on the origins and development of the ballad. Steve Gardham has argued that it may well be the closest text we have to the original and for which he has attempted a reconstruction. At some point in the evolution of the ballad in England, the concept of, a bro of the brothers as merchants who trade across the ocean has been lost. In the Hereford Bridgewater versions, the brothers plow the ocean. This to me is clearly an incongruous relic of the brothers as seagoing merchants. In several American versions, the brothers are also, also plow the ocean. The Bridgewater merchant of 1860, at Bridgewater there lived a merchant who had two sons and a daughter fair. Twas o'er the seas their sons did venture, all for to bring back their gain. They had an apprentice by firm indenture, and they sent him factor over the main. That word factor I shall refer to later as well. I'm going to play the tune of the Hereford version because these three tunes are actually remarkably beautiful tunes. I've transcribed them again into Sibelius and these are MIDI files. And here's Jesse Coles from Hampshire. And lastly, but by no means least, Caroline Hughes's version <coughs> recorded by Ewan McCall and Peggy Seeger in 1962 in Dorset. She both diddled the tune and then sang the words to it. Beautiful version. Now the ending of the Bridgewater version, the Bridgewater Merchant version of circa 1860, the brothers drown at sea. <clears throat> O oh dear brothers, thou knowest the reason that makes your sister look so wan. Against the law you have acted treason, and for the same you shall swing, i.e. they are threatened with being hung. But, in fact, they do not get hung. They go away to sea. The murderers, knowing their grief and sorrow, straight away on board a ship did go, but these young men were washed over, and the seas became their silent grave. Now, once, once you lose from the storyline, as clearly happened in England, the merchant the merchants going to sea, the brothers being merchants or they're going to sea, as soon as you lose that, it seems pretty irrelevant to have a seagoing conclusion at the end. And that seems to be what's happened. So in the Degweed family versions, oh sister dear, what is the matter? What makes you look so pale and thin or wan as it was in the American version? Dear brothers, you both know the reason and for the same you shall be hung, or as they said, swung in the other, swing in the other one. So both these brothers both were taken and was bound down in iron strong and at the last of all their assizes they stood their trials and both got hung. Now we know that the Brazil version is different at the end and that's the same as Alice Gillington's version that she recorded in the New Forest Gypsy Ballad in the 1920s I think. Uh, where the, she, the, the dinner is the great, a dinner then is the girls provided, she provided on the very next day, she poisoned herself and her two own brothers, and all four of them in one grave did lay. Another alternative ending um, is Emma v Overd's version, also George Whitcomb's, where they don't have the conclusion at all. The girl remains beside the body, and along with, along with the body, she stays till death and expects to be buried beside them. From this I draw some conclusions and have some questions. Without exception, no English variants have, have the father or family as merchants, and no American variants have the father as a farmer. In spite of this, it seems that a single broadside printing is the likely origin of all the diverse strands of the tradition. The ballad has evolved by a process of reduction and recreation during the oral transmission from an unknown original text based on an English translation of Boccaccio's tale in the Decameron without recourse to the stabilizing influence of any printed text. 
There are four distinct tune text families in the English corpus of the ballad, which suggests initial divergence from an original text, followed by a linear evolution with little crossing between the versions, that is text crossings, of course. In the 1820 translation of Boccaccio, the apprentice is referred to as a factor, the very same word used in the American songster text. This suggests the ballad may have been written shortly after 1820 and that the ballad does not date back to an earlier translation of Boccaccio in the 17th or 18th centuries as suggested by Belden and Gardham. Thanks to Steve Roud and the Vaughan Williams Memorial Library and all that one can get there on manuscripts from Cecil Sharp, Gardner, Broadwood, Vaughan Williams and others, to Steve Gardham for the text of the Bridgewater Merchant from the Pioneer Songster published in 2009 and for his online article, The Bridgewater Merchant. That's it. There's Lemmy again. And you might like to see the Brazel family hop picking in Kent in 1900. I'm not sure which is Lemmy. I have a feeling that Lemmy might be this one here. And there's the credits again. Thanks very much. I shall un. Uh, I shall undo that. How do I? How do I finish that? Escape it. Yes. Just stop sharing your screen. I think. Sure. Excellent. Thank you very much, Peter. That was fascinating. Excellent to have a, a sort of um, research into one particular song or set of songs like that. And I think that's certainly what we need to do. And we need to read it sometime. Listening to it has brought up lots of questions in my mind, but I can't remember them. <laughs> <laughs> I have to read it again. Well, it brought up lots of questions in my mind, I tell you. <laughs> if anybody wants to make a comment or ask a question, they have to raise their hand. Um, nobody has yet. Remind me how the people raise their hands, Martin. They go, they hover over their names in the participants box and go to the box marked more and there will be a little thing say, raise hand. Raise your hand. That's right. I can't raise my hand because I'm a co-host. But Right, we have Simon Harmer as our first raised hand. Hello. Are you there, Simon? Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. My question is, um, the melody that Alice Gillington collected in the New Forest, I didn't see that in any of the four tune families. Well, the ch the, I'll tell you why. I'm sure the tune's wrong. I'm sure that the tune belongs to the first four or five stanzas, which were a different song. Yeah. Well, so she doesn't. She doesn't have. Basically, it's the the, the, the travellers, which I've seen other travellers do the same thing. They've mixed two songs together. They started with one song and proceeded to to, to the break of briars or whatever it was called with her um, after the fifth verse. The the start is completely unrelated to the second part of the song. Yeah, and so I think agree. the tune it probably belongs to the other song, and therefore I haven't considered it. Okay, thank you. I do know that she collected that from uh, Tom Pateman in 1908 in Thorny Hill. Is that the name of the person she got it from? Yeah. Right. Tom Bateman. Tom Pateman. Bate right. Yes, well, it, 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 right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Um, Paul. Paul Burgess. Hello. Um, are there, do you have any plans to issue the recordings of the Stevens family? Um, because it's a fabulous performance from the bits you played. I'm very regretful of the fact that I didn't go back to visit them. I mean, I visited them that one day with Riley Stevens. I recorded the grandfather and he sang a version of the of, of uh, um, Blacksmith Courted Me, the one with the flattened Mixolydian scale version of it. Only one tune. He also sang uh, several other songs, just two or three songs. One of them was, uh, was uh, Hangman, Hangman, Hold Your Hand, which is very unusual, not very common to collect. I had not got it before and then we went to the pub and in the pub we started talking about songs and Mark said he'd like to sing me one so I went out into the car and we recorded it in the car that and two other songs and that's it I should have gone back to visit him <laughs> yeah so Paul you were asking if it if um, Peter was going to issue the recording that's you. right yes well, it's, it's always been my intention. They, they, they weren't included. For some reason, the Brazil one wasn't included in the, in the musical traditions double, triple CD. And I think the reason for that probably was it's a fairly disrupted version. She doesn't sing it very coherently. And a lot of, it, a lot of the text we've got as a result of discussion and recording it twice or three times. Um, 
and the other one, Mark Stevens, well, it doesn't, it didn't fit into the Brazil, the Brazil family collection or the Smith Valley family collection. Yeah. But I have intended to put out a, another collection of other songs that haven't got into those collections. That would be fabulous. Yes, that would be good. <laughs> All those in favour, put their hands up. Yes, <laughs> right. Um, John, John Baxter has a little blue hand up. Yeah, this may this may be a really stupid question, but I was really interested that you were you found a, a song with the Lydian scale uh, in 1966, and I know that Lydian scales were really quite prevalent in modern jazz in the 40s and 50s. So uh, it's probably an impossible question to answer, but can you? Is it possible that he's been influenced by listening to other? types of music and the sort of tunes that he's singing i think it's highly, un highly unlikely i think i think i don't know why i don't know why he has that scale. it works very well i've a i've provided accompaniment for it a piano the piano the, the harmonies are, are, are superb yeah. um because the i won't go through the the, the chords you need but i mean it, it works extremely well without the without the chord that you would normally get on the fifth of the scale of the well, fourth of the scale i mean sorry um so, uh, no, I don't know. It works extremely well. I'm sure he doesn't know he's varying the pitch of his fourth in the scale. I'm sure he doesn't. And, uh, but uh, I, uh, the fact was that Sharp, Sharp's version was also from a gypsy. And uh, it may well be, I mean, it's purely hypothetical, but it may well be that the gypsy family traditions have a musical tradition that, that, that is quite happy with Lydian scales. Um, they certainly, it is considered that the, the gypsy families, the gypsy traditions that we collect do have quite a lot of difference from the, from the oral tr traditions, the musical traditions of other rural family, rural singers in South of England. They're often quite different and to me quite interesting. So I don't, I don't know the answer. It's very interesting anyway, thank you. Yes, thank you, John. Uh, Lisa, Lisa now, you've got your hand up. Okay, hi Peter. Uh, you you and I had been uh, talking by email before, and it uh, jigged my memory. Um, uh, there's a version of uh, that song in "Come and I Will Sing You," my uh, songbook that that uh, several of us put out in the 80s. Uh, I collected it in 1979 from Johnny Tobias Pearson, and it's called "The Constant Farmer's Son." That. That's interesting. I haven't looked at those versions because I believe it's not the same. It's not considered to be the same song. It's considered to be a completely different song, maybe to be inspired by it, but it's not the same song. I think I'm right in saying. I, I was not Perhaps so. I believe so. I did ask you, actually, one thing that interests me. If the song, in fact, only dates to 1820, which I suspect is true, much as it surprises me, and much as it probably disappoints those who would love to see it dating back to medieval times, if it if it started in nineteen in eighteen twenty, then the American version of it from eighteen fifty is only thirty years later. It clearly was not widely available in print, if it was in print at all, which we suspect it was. It's clearly entered into a, a, sm a small number of diverse strands which haven't influenced each other greatly. They've just they've all become corrupted from the original in one way or another. But also, if you look at the original text, that uh, that, uh, that the suspected original text, it's very it's very odd. There's a lot of the the the, 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 the uh, Bridgewater Merchant of 1850. That text is not a good text. It's kind of badly written. So I think probably it dates back to a badly written original. And in fact, uh, um, Belden felt the same. He felt it was a badly written original. The, the rhyming structure is actually unusual in, in, as well, because the, the rhyming structure of the original, if not of the original, the one we're seeing is the oldest, um, is the 1851. The rhyming structure is A, B, A, B. In other words, the first and third line rhyme and the second and fourth line rhyme. Now, for short lines like that, I don't think that makes sense. I don't think singers like it. You know, um, there was a, a rich farmer who, in Bruton Town, there lived a farmer. He da 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 da, and that's the rhyme. Da 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 da. Rhyme. So the rhyme makes sense at the end of the third and fourth line. It doesn't, to my mind, make very much sense at the end of the second, first, and third. And it's been lost. If you look at most of the versions that have been collected from tradition, they have not retained the A B A B. They've gone A B C B. So I suspect that if it was written in 1820. 
Uh, and the other thing I would be interested to do, I don't think there's any, I don't think most of the American versions, if any, come from the Appalachians. I think they may have come from a, a fairly 1800s emigration to the States. And that would be interesting to know. I don't know the answer to that. But if the, if the, if the, if the families they've been collected from actually date themselves to 1800 emigration rather than the 1700s, that also might reinforce the idea. Why are the, and if, if it was, if it was a, if it was a ballad that dated back to the 1700s or 1600s, then you would expect versions to be all over the, all over the United States amongst the older emigration things. I was also interested to ask um, Lisa Null whether there were any versions from Newfoundland, because again, some of the emigration to Newfoundland from Dorset and from the south of England was prior to the 1800s. So the fact that there isn't a version in Newfoundland would be surprising in some ways, because Newfoundland loves the old English versions from the south of England. Well, my family emigrated to Newfoundland in the 1700s from Somerset and uh, the community that I got this song from uh, was my home community and there were a number of families there that had emigrated from Somerset. So I was thinking that it was, it might be a version of the same song. I'll send it to you and you yes. can make your yes. own judgment. Thank you. Right, we'll have to move on a bit because we've got three people waiting now. But from, from what you said, Peter, we're actually looking for a, a bad broadside writer somebody who wrote so. bad songs yes <laughs> right um, who's not very good at it Gwilym Gwilym Davis are you there yeah yes I'm just going to ask Peter um uh Danny Brazel that was Lemmy's mother of course had a, a version was it pretty much the same as as Lemmy's do you know no Danny Danny didn't really know it he, he and I he he was with me when the second time we visited Lemmy and we, you know, we were able to discuss the song and he sang a verse of it. But I mean, of course, he wasn't a good singer, but, but he sang the same tune approximately. But he, it was the same text. And I never asked. I, I wish I'd asked a lot of the other members of the family yeah. about the song. That's, but that I was my next question. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't ask. It, it's one of, the, okay. you know, it just didn't happen. Fair enough. Okay, right, thank, thank you. Thank you. Therese, Therese McIntyre. Oh, yeah. I just had a question actually about the Stevens version because he was the only singer that seemed to use any sort of ornamentation, um, not very much, but he used some grace notes at the end of the phrase and all that. Are there regional differences in English singing where say there'd be areas of the country that might ornament more or less the way they are in the Irish tradition? Uh, well, that's a very good question. It interests me certainly. And he does use decoration. He doesn't use it in a very coherent way. He's not a very it's not a very accurate way he uses it, as often happens in Irish singing. But yes, he is using decoration. I agree with you. Um, I think some of the travellers do, and some. I, I was always interested to find any decoration when any of the amongst the, the recordings that I made. Um, and there are, of course, some noted English singers that did use decoration. Um, but uh, I can't really answer that. But yes, I, his singing is very nice, very good. Thanks. Right, we're going to have to move on to Marge in a moment. So just quick questions from Conrad. If you're there, Conrad. Conrad, Blady, unmute yourself. Yeah, one wonders why it is that this song persisted. The, the tune seems a bit difficult. And there's the idea of what's, what's happening here. They're, they're going over overseas and then they're catching up with the, with the guy and uh, doing him in. Now is this, in the, in the early 19th century, is this a, a problem that's widespread uh, among servants or is it, is it just something that is ordinary? If it's ordinary then you sort of wonder why the song was so popular and there you go with the idea of going across the sea and immigration. So immigration might carry a lot of weight as well as to why it is in so many variants and has persisted. That's it. Well, it, it, it hasn't been, it, it is not a popularly collected song at all. It's very rare. I mean, I would say it's not extremely rare, but it's pretty rare. And why is it, why has it survived? Well, it's got a fantastic story. The middle section of the ballad is extraordinarily compelling. You know, I mean, a girl falls in love with a, with a servant man and the brothers don't like it and they, they murder him. They take him away and murder him and they bury his body. And she then has a dream. He appears to her in the dream. I mean, it's a fantastic story. The only bit that's missing, of course, which I didn't mention, is the, 
which is present in Boccaccio, of course, which you probably know from the Isabella in the Pot of Basil, is that in that version she brings back his head, puts it in the bottom of a plant pot, puts a basil plant over it and weeps beside it every day, for an hour, I believe, and the brothers got up, get upset at this, they throw the pot away, and she dies of sorrow. That bit is missing. Now, why is that missing? I don't know. Maybe the ballad writer thought it was a bit too much. On the other hand, maybe that was there and is not, has never survived at all. Who can tell? Uh, the, fantastic uh, story. What's left of the story, the middle section of the story, is a fantastically powerful little story. The, uh, the, the, the wonder is that in that period of time when there was a lot of stress and division and social change, maybe this was a, an active uh, newspaper story and it was also part of the reason that it was compelling. Right, uh, sorry, I think we're going to have to move on to Marge now, otherwise we're going to uh, have to... Thank you very much. Yep, and I think I am unmuted now, can you hear me? Hello? Yes. Okay, am I, am I, am I good? Can you hear me? Good. Yes? Oh, Steve, you're muted. Um, can you hear me? Am I on? You are. You're fine, Margaret. Okay. Right. So, yeah. Sorry, Margaret. I was accidentally muted there. Yes, we All are right. ready for you. But I was just saying thank you to Peter. Sure. Um, so a round of applause, a round of silent applause on the screens there for, for Peter. Thank you very much indeed, Peter. So moving on to Marge. Yep. Are you there? I'm right here. If you can hear me. We can. Yes. Yes. Good. Um, and this is by a region for a region. Louise Manny and a Folk Song Renaissance. Louise Manny, unique among folk song collectors, both male and female, sought to preserve songs of a region for, a, for the people of that region. And she single-handedly galvanized the locality around a folk song renaissance, whose most tangible ongoing legacy is the Miramichi Folk Song Festival. And it's, we're gonna have the 63rd um, next week that will be virtual and I can talk to people about that. Louise Manny was born on February 21st, uh, 1890 in Gilead, Maine, the only child of Charles de Graff and Minette Lee Harding Manny. At the age of three, she moved with her parents to Newcastle, New Brunswick. Her father exported spool wood, blocks of straight grained birch, to Scotland thread manufacturers. She was educated at St. Mary's Academy, Newcastle, Halifax Ladies Academy, and um, McGill University, um, she, where she got a degree in French um, and, and English in 1913. She taught at Halifax Ladies Academy from 1913 to 1915 where, for at least part of that time, Helen Creighton was a student. When her father became ill, she returned to Newcastle to become secretary and later office manager of her father's business, where she remained until 1946. During this period, she may well have had contact through the business with woodsmen, but class distinctions would have prohibited any but the most formal interactions with them. While working in her father's business, Mar Manny sold insurance and began to deal in antiques, antiques and uh, rare books. Her antiquarian interests soon established her as the historian of the Miramichi. She wrote weekly newspaper columns, consulted with the New Brunswick Museum, and produced two publications on New Brunswick shipping, Ships of Kent County, 1949, and uh, Ships of Miramichi, 1960. Under the aegis of her old friend, Lord Beaverbrook, the Newcastle-born British newspaper magnate, she oversaw the restoration of the enclosure, which had been the burial ground for the earliest settlers of the Miramichi. In recognition of her efforts, Beaverbrook purchased the old Presbyterian manse and established a library there, which Manny headed. In 1947, Lord Beaverbrook challenged Manny to collect New Brunswick folk songs. As a boy, he had been so taken with a fragment of the Jones Boys that later he taught it to Roosevelt, Churchill, and Stalin, who went back to Russia 
humming it. It's a great story. Huh? Anyway, inspired by that song, Beaverbrook said to Manny, I'll send you fine recording equipment. She, and she says, I, have, I had a few sketchy ideas of folk song. I, need, I knew people collected them in the Appalachian Mountains, that, songs, that folk song societies existed in England, and that Europeans held festivals where people in quaint costumes sang songs of their ancestors. But I didn't know that folk songs were sung all around me in New Brunswick. Having been disabused of her notions about the lack of folk songs in New Brunswick, Manny set to work. As she freely admitted, she knew absolutely nothing about folk song before Beaverbrook's challenge. But with a director, director, directive from Beaverbrook to collect New Brunswick folk songs, especially songs originating in New Brunswick, she enlisted the aid of Bessie Crocker, an organist at the Newcastle United Church, who provided both musical expertise and a car. Through making personal visits to people in country districts and through ads placed in the local newspaper and at, lo and at the local movie has house, Manny amassed information on songs, singers, and folk poets like Larry Gorman, who would become the subject of an article by Manny and a, a monograph by Sandy Ives. Here are some excerpts from Manny's notes of October 4th, 1947. Mrs. McNaughton, Crocker's former maid, says Stanley MacDonald knows a lot of old songs, lives three houses above her home. There are three Willie McDonalds in Glenwood. Wilmot MacDonald, who would become Manny's and later uh, Ives's star informant, knows old songs. Rankin McLean, Black River, interviewed, says he knows the song about Howard Carey, the Grand Falls man who died in Rumford Falls, Maine. It is very long. Mr. McLean wouldn't sing it on a Sunday. It is probably safe to say that in-depth life histories or the sort of contextual interviews carried out by modern day folklorists um, were, were not done. Um, unique about Manny's collecting style is that few, if any, recordings were made in people's homes. As she explained in a letter to Beaverbrook of February 3rd, 1947, few of the singers had electricity, which was necessary to run the 70 pound disc machine. She further maintained that had she gotten a more portable battery operated machine, many of the singers would have been embarrassed to perform at home with the neighbors lurking around the windows, so they preferred to come into Newcastle to be recorded. So again, ads were placed in the paper and in the, on the movie house screen, and the sessions um, uh, were to become the nucleus of the Lord Beaverbrook collection of Newcastle, of New, of New Brunswick um, recordings that took place in November 20th, 19th, uh, 20th, 24th, and 25th of 1947 in the Newcastle Legion Hall with Stan Cassidy of the CBC present to run the recording machine. And by the way, I have copies of the entire Beaverbrook collection on, on recording. Susan Butler, the current director of the Miramichi Folk Song Festival, describes what the sessions might have been like. It was the late Major Joe Campbell, who told me the story of the early recordings with Miss Manny. His father apparently sang for Manny. The potential recorders were gathered in a hall in Newcastle, and they were all very nervous. When Miss Manny asked them to come forward to be recorded, no one would make a move. Miss Manny asked Mr. Campbell why they would not sing. Campbell suggested that some lubrication of the vocal cords might help. Miss Manny stated, why didn't you tell me this before? On that note, Dr. Manny pr proceeded to open her purse and give Mr. Campbell some money to go to the local government store to get some liquor, liquid. The story goes that in no time, everybody was fighting over the mic to perform. Manny herself wrote to Beaverbrook of, of the challenges she faced at these sessions, which were as we might say, legion.
Um, singers, when singer, singers are there, yeah. if the singers are interrupted or thrown off by anything, they may have to begin again at the beginning. They can't tell us how long the song is. All that we can do is guess, put them in front of the mic microphone, and when we come to the end of a record, I take down the song in shorthand, put on another record, and start there again. Sometimes, if I give the preceding verse, they can do it. Sometimes they have to begin at the very beginning. That's from February 3rd, 1948. Some singers had colds, and actually this is, let's, let's listen to track one, which I think is um, Willie McDonald um, singing a bit of the scow on Cowden Shore. So let's hear that. Martin, are you there? We got the recording. We're not hearing anything, Martin. No, we're not hearing anything. I know it worked yesterday. Yeah. I can see that Martin is working hard on trying to make it work. Yeah. Talk amongst yourselves. So, well, oh, don't. <laughs> all right. Well, I hope we can hear the recordings okay, because it adds. It's it adds something to hear the singers. Yeah. Well, we, yes, we want to hear them if we can. Yes. I think Martin's trying to make trying to wind it up. My name is there we go. You need not be alarmed, you have heard of me before. I can make a song or sing it, I can make it neat and bring it. And the title that I give it is the Scow at Cowden Shores. <clears throat> There's those two young guys with their own human vices. Keep making curious voices till their very throats get sore. A wolf or an Indian devil, they would be far more civil than these uncultivated rubbish round the scow at Cowden Shores. Some singers had colds, as we just heard, and one fellow, Hemlock Stewart, thought he'd accompany. George Campbell's rendition of the eight pound bass on the piano, Manny deemed this contribution most unwelcome. Um, from her recording sessions on, Manny was hooked on folk song and on collecting. She had more recording sessions in the Legion Hall in 1948. She began to host a radio show of local songs and singers, um, not when not only um, Oh, she also corresponded with collectors such as uh, Alan Lomax and uh, Edith Folk and William Dorflinger and Helen Creighton. And Helen and she would become fast friends. From the outset, it became apparent that Manny would not be able to stick to Beaverbrook's directive to collect only songs that had originated in New Brunswick. Her first recording session, for example, um, yielded a version of Bold William Taylor and the Wexford Lass, among other non-local songs. In the same letter of February 1948, quoted, which I quoted earlier, Manny wrote to Beaverbrook, you asked especially for songs which originated in New Brunswick, and this is what we have aimed for. Of course, when a song has been sung for 50 to 80 years, many people think it originated here. The Jam on Jerry's Rock, for example, the favorite song of Lumberman the world over, has been claimed by every locality or stream where they drove logs, from the Miramichi to Michigan to British Columbia. Um, hang on here. Um, let's see. Okay. Um, of course, these lumbermen, if they added 
as they traveled from, from one locality to another, um, everywhere they went, they took their songs with them. Also, where they went, they learned other songs and brought them home. It's very hard to tell where a song originated. Songs written by local poets are often very derivative. Also, if a lumberman adds four lines to a song, he thinks he wrote it. Manny advocated, as the Lomax su suggested to her, that as many variants of a song as possible be collected, as well as all the folk songs sung in New Brunswick, including English and Scottish ballads. Beaverbrook never seems to have gotten the point, and he cut off Manny's funding in 1950. But Manny was hooked, as I said, and her enthusiasm for folk songs spread through the region and well beyond. As I mentioned earlier, she began a weekly 15-minute radio show, which was even on for twice a week for a while. Um, and um, she, not only would she play the discs um, from the Beaverbrook collection, but singers would actually come into the studio to perform. People sent in requests for specific songs and um, would write in making requests in honor of people's birthdays and stuff. Um, Manny requested songs for her research and in turn fans asked Manny for copies of songs. The show became mandatory fare for Miramichi residents to such an extent that lumbermen would cease work from 2 to 2.15 on Wednesday afternoons despite the protests of foremen. So Manny voluntarily changed the time from Wednesdays to Sundays. In May 1950, Manny wrote to Beaverbrook, since last October, I have given two folk song programs a week. You would be surprised by the interest taken by all classes. The people in the country districts, of course, are simply delighted to hear what they call th their own songs. By this time, too, the CBC was camped on her doorstep, as Manny put it, and she and Helen Creighton were asked to engage in four dialogues on folk song on the CBC Maritime Met Network. Um, well, my paper is coming apart. Um, okay. Also at this time, a much larger folk song revival was taking place, and um, the Manny Creighton correspondence talks about um, to sh about sharing their um, use of songs. On the one hand, Manny was protective of her Miramichi material, and she talked about recording the songs um, before the Library of Congress could get there to record. She was nonetheless proud when recordings were given to Dorflinger to copy, and that attracted an audience in the New York City. Quote, I did send Dorflinger, the boys of the, Al the uh, island, sung by Jared McLean. He sent the rec record down to a place on 6th Avenue to be copied, and he said that as strains of the boys floated out over 6th Avenue um, and 42nd Street, quite a crowd gathered to hear it. And that was from December 29th, 1950. Dr. Manny's folk song work expanded to include Acadian and Mi'kmaq material. In 1953, for example, Manny and Creighton made recordings on the Mi'kmaq Reserve and Eel Ground. In 1958, Manny turned her attention to the establishment of the Miramichi Folk Song Festival, which she saw as a venue for the woodsmen and their friends to sing and hear the old songs. Through the radio program and through her newspaper ads, she promoted the festival as a contest with judges that included Helen Creighton and Sandy Ives. She had met Ives the previous summer when he had contacted her about his research on Larry Gorman. Manny chose the contest format in which singers had to submit in advance the names of the songs they would sing, and she did this for three reasons. Manny was afraid that without the lure of a competition and prize money, singers might not come. This is what Sandy told me. Um, also, secondly, uh, she was protecting what she perceived as an unwritten law of copyright, 
as, as the songs identified with a certain singer so they wouldn't be sung by somebody else, thus generating bad feeling. And most importantly, she wanted to ensure that what was sung was indeed folk song, as she and the judge conceived folk song. And here's what she said in a letter to Sandy Ives, uh, 1958. It is, quite it is quite important to stabilize the folk song idea. For many people would not know to exclude the baggage car ahead, but maybe that is a folk song. Um, uh, okay. Um, hang on. Anyway, sometimes she and I've had disagreements about what constituted folk song, but in the end, S Sandy says the standard was very high. The idea of awarding, award, awarding prizes, which included a Zippo lighter and five or ten dollars a piece, was to make the money go as far as possible without hurting anybody's feelings. From the very outset, the festival was a success and it attr attracted traditional singers and an audience large enough to fill the 350 seat Beaverbrook Theater in Newcastle's Town Hall. Participants included Wilmot, and we'll hear from him later, Wilmot, Stanley, and Arthur MacDonald from the Black River area, Frank and Ray Eastie, who sang together, um, Alan Kelly, whom we'll hear in a minute. Uh, he was known as the French Irishman in, the, in Beaverbrook Station, Lord Nick Underhill of Northwest Bridge, and Sam Jago of Newcastle. All had been lumbermen and had known each other in the woods. Women, including Marie Hare and Kate Buckley, and Kate was Acadian. Anyway, Marie Hare was one of the singers, and we're going to hear from her in a minute because uh, her signature song became Round Her Mantle So Green. So actually, let's hear that, a snippet of it. Content was wide ranging from Le Soldat Assassiné, which is Alan Kelly uh, singing that that's actually the English uh, language uh, equivalent is Edmund of the Lowlands Low or Young Emily. But I'm, let's play um, Alan Kelly, who, who was known as the French Irishman in the Lumber Woods. And this is a snippet of Le Soldat Assassiné or Le, le Complaint de Soldats. Let's hear a snippet of that. So content was wide ranging, including Acadian um, songs, an example of which we just heard. We also had the child ballad, Hind Horn, sung by Delton Brown. Local ballads like the Miramichi Fire, sung by Edmund Robichaud. The Lost Babes of Halifax, rendered by Sam Jago. Manny reported that Jago held his audience spellbound throughout this unaccompanied piece, which took 15 minutes to perform. One reason for this rapt attention is that the audience consisted largely of the lumbermen and their friends who knew, who knew the tradition intimately. Evidence of this can be seen in 
responses to Wilmot McDonald singing the Lumberman's Alphabet, um, with which he opened and closed the festival each year. When he got to L for the lice boys that or our shirts creep, he would scratch his chest vigorously, which would bring uproarious laughter from the audience. And you can actually hear an example of that. And there's a folkways record from 1959. So I don't have that, but you can hear um, a snippet here of uh, the opening verse of uh, the, the Lumberman's Alphabet. So let's hear that. No mortal on earth is as happy are we. Come me hi, dearie, ho, dearie, hi, dearie, don't give a chant advice, whiskey, there's nothing goes wrong. The festival became an affirmation of lumbering and of a Miramichi identity, even if the singing tradition was becoming part of a memory culture. Sometimes festivals were marred by petty jealousies and by too much alcohol. Indeed, Wilmot MacDonald boycotted the festival in 1962 and 1963 when Manny tried to rein in his drinking. Nonetheless, the festival had profound effects on the singers and on the tradition. Alan Kelly, whose active repertoire consisted of French language songs largely devoid of local content, began singing songs in English from his passive repertoire, such as the Steamer Alexander, um, which um, commemorates the drowning of a, a, a man that falls overboard from the steamer uh, in the 19th century. So why don't we hear a snippet of that? Sandy Ives described how interchanges between Wilmot MacDonald and Nick Underhill at the festival and in other contexts orchestra were or orchestrated by Manny, um, then they, because they rarely socialized together otherwise, helped to renew Wilmot's interest and jog his memory and significantly amend his performances of The Doors of Ivory, which is Lady Isabel and the Elf Knight a song which we ha he had not much cared for previously. Um, songs were composed about the festival itself. Uh, the late John Jilks, whom I knew also, um, John Jilks wrote songs about the festival from the outset and until well into the 1960s. And let's, let's uh, hear this uh, song that he wrote about the early festival in 58. A uh, no folk festival was planned by Miss Louise Manny. There came a lovely evening, September the third, when we came here to Newcastle, her folk song to be heard. Came here to this town hall, a goodly crowd was here. 
so we set up to listen the songs of you for They were English songs and French songs and Irish ones as well. Both young and old joined in this fun to make this festival. Stanley MacDonald also wrote a song about the 1960 festival, and why don't we hear that? Now this man is our leader, and that you all don't know. We hope she lives just many more years for to put on this show. For she is a fine lady, as you would wish to see. And I know she takes an interest in our folk from Jamboree. So now I'll speak of the judges, we have them one, two, three. Two of them have come a long way for the judge our Jamboree. Our first is Dr. Helen Creighton, sitting right here below. And she has that cheery smile for you when you come to this microphone. <laughs> The festival and Manny's folk song work continued to thrive. In 1968, she co-authored Songs of Miramichi with James Reginald Wilson, a Miramichi-born musicologist. And I think we've got maybe the front cover of the book up there, on, do we? On the, the Sorry, people can no, see? we don't, Marge. Huh? We don't, I'm afraid. Don't have to look, no. Oh, okay, well, all right, well, it's hard to get a copy of the book now, but I, I did find one on eBay that I gifted to my friend Hillary, whom I, by the way, I want to thank her for editing these uh, sound snippets for me. Anyway, um, so thank you, Hillary, if you're there. Copies of this book were ubiquitous in the region, at least through the 1990s. And, and Susan Butler, the current director at that time, at least into the 90s, was urging people to learn songs from the book. But anyway, okay. So Manny was awarded two honorary doctorates in 1961, had a mountain named after her in 1969, and in 1970 she died, having lived a life of extraordinary achievement. What accounts for Manny's success as a folk song uh, collector? In the first place, um, she possessed what Sandy Ives called a low-key imperiousness and was called by a local librarian, the benevolent bulldozer. If she <laughs> wanted Dick Underhill to sing at a teacher's convention, she could simply call the mill owner and get him the day off. She got away with this probably because she was a member of the elite, but above all, her passion her folk song was so infectious that people forgave her that imperiousness and were won over. So actually, um, the, the festival, as I said, it's still going on, um, but um, it's morphed a lot, actually, um, because, of course, all the old lumbermen, even people that I knew, have all passed on. And so what has happened especially now, whereas before songs were mostly unaccompanied, now accompaniment is much more the norm. I would say that the old songs, while still sung, are a comparatively low percentage of what goes on at the festival. So now you've got more professional musicians, you have singer-songwriters, Fiddlers, fiddling is very popular there. Um, but people, what has remained constant, I think, is the emphasis on Miramichi identity. So there are still songwriters who are writing about local events, even still some satirical songs in the tradition of Larry Gorman. But, but, but again, songs that very much celebrate uh, the Miramichi. And so there have been two other directors since Manny's death. Um, we had um, Maisie Mitchell, who died in, I think, 1986. So she died just before I came to the first 
my first festival. And then Susan Butler, the current director, I don't know if she's listening. Um, Susan Butler expanded the festival from ninth, for, to a, now a, a week long event from, from uh, so it now goes for a week. Um, and uh, so it's, it's, real, it's evolved um, and I, I've been involved in the festival myself since 86 as initially as an ethnographer, but I've now become a performer too. And if you want to know what the festival is like now, you could go next week, beginning on August 2nd, August 2nd and August 3rd, there is a virtual festival. All the video, videos were pre-recorded and there are gonna be two concerts that um, you know, were put together. So it starts at 5 p.m. Um, British summertime, I guess, on August 2nd. So you can go to the festival website and you can listen via Facebook or YouTube. So the, so the two, two days of events will be um, August 2nd and August 3rd. And it's still a very, very rich festival. And I could give another whole talk on the festival um, since Louise Manny's death. So, so there you go, that's my talk. Thank you very much, Marge. That was, that was great. Sure, uh, and I'd uh, obviously love to take questions. Uh, yeah, very good. Round of applause all, all around. Um, put your hand up if you want to speak. We still have 10 minutes if you want to say something or ask something. I love that phrase, Benella, Benella. Oh, I'm a bulldozer. bulldozer. <laughs> That must be the best, best description I've ever heard of a folk song collector, benevolent bulldozer. I wish I could have met her. She was, I was 18 when she died, so. Right. Yeah. Well, I haven't got any questions yet, so I could um, mention that a, a version of Marge's talk that she's just given is available in a book if you want to read it, Folk Song, Tradition, Revival and Recreation. I'll put it on the chat list in a minute when I can. Um, that was published a while ago by the Elphinstone Institute. So if you want to read it as well as hearing it, that's the way to do it. Now somebody had their hand up and then it went. Ah, oh, Margaret. Oh. Margaret Bennett. Are you there, Margaret? Speak to me, Margaret. Yes, I'm Yes, I'm here. That was uh, wonderful, fascinating. Um, I was fascinated to, to know that um, she didn't record the singers in their homes because, of course, no electricity. And that was also the case with Marjorie Kennedy Fraser when she went to the Western House. That's much earlier, 1910 and so on. Uh, but she didn't go to their homes either. Um, they, were, they all had to walk along to a certain house in which she stayed because the equipment so, was so huge. She wasn't going to lug it about, and she was a kind of a lady like Louise Manny, not used to that kind of stuff as well. So I just thought it was fascinating this idea of going to going somewhere else to sing, not the house that you're accustomed to sing it. Yeah, I agree. And again, the, the class differences, and because there was um, a considerable amount of class stratification, so you didn't just show up at or invite people to your house and and as she said she thought that neighbors you know there'd be neighbors lurking around the windows and she thought people might be embarrassed yes yes i i didn't know this until recently my great grandfather was recorded and my mother grew up knowing about this and it was it was one of my students who found out she said did marjorie kennedy fraser go to your house oh no no said my mother my grandfather had to walk all along the shore and then into the village and down to the place where she stayed in a very grand house. Yeah. So it's fascinating. Yeah, yeah. Well, apparently Manny would maybe visited people's houses initially, but then she got them to go to the, to the Legion Hall to actually record. Thank okay. you. Thank you. I'm going to go to Derek next because we haven't heard from him yet. Derek Schofield. Hello, just a, a brief comment that that's how Percy Granger did his phonograph recordings as well. Um, he sort of, you know, went out and found the singers and then they got invited in or brought in by car, I suppose, 
to uh, the house he was staying in because that's where the equipment was. It was just too, uh, it just wasn't feasible to put it, strap it to the back of the bike and cycle up the, yeah. uh, up the lanes. <laughs> right. It weren't tarmac at that time. Yeah, th thank you. Yes, you're, uh, you're right, Derek. Uh, Peter, Peter Shepherd. Unmute yourself, Peter. <laughs> yes, I was yeah. interested to hear some of that. Uh, I, of course, uh, as as uh, Margaret knows, uh, I did know, and he, I know, I know, that I was at the Newcastleton Festival, Miramichi Festival, a couple of times. We were there. Um, she was a great, she was a great person to meet. And you, could, I think, I shouldn't have the impression that she didn't have uh, friendly house relationships with the singers, because when we were there, she put on a house concert for us, and she brought all these house singers party. a house party for her uh, into her house, and we stayed in her house as well. So she was a very friendly person. I mean, she was very easygoing, and uh, certainly we also knew Woman McDonald, and I can see why she. Uh, well, we saw it there. Uh, she, she definitely didn't. She needed to know who was going to sing what, partly because they might have sung something inappropriate on the concert. <laughs> and certainly she managed, managed to keep tight hand on the, on the alcohol. We also went to visit one of Wilmot's um, nephews, uh, because we heard about that from, Mar from Margaret, actually, Margaret Steiner, in Moncton, New Brunswick, about 10 years ago. But he didn't sing the songs anymore. They used to go back every year. He and, his, uh, he and the McDonald's used to go back to what's called McDonald Road in the area where the McDonald's lived. They went down for a, for a, 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 a cookout on the ground at, at the house and they would have a party. In fact, he showed me a lovely video of them having sing song and playing fiddle music sitting in the house where Wilma McDonald used to live. So they, but they haven't kept it. But on this, this particular cousin, uh, nephew, they were into country music. You know, he, 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 uh, he played fiddle, he played, his wife played the bass, and they went off to country music gatherings all over the place. So things have changed, as we know. Things change. Yes, they do. Uh, Conrad, you got your hand up. Conrad? Unmute yourself. Unmute myself. You're muted. We can see you, but we can't hear you. That's it. All right, there we are. So we've got this group of people singing songs, and they stop singing songs. And the festival is raging on and on and on. Why, why do they stop singing songs is one question. And uh, what about lumber? Are they still lumbering? And who's lumbering? Are they speaking Spanish or some other language now? Are they a different culture group? Around here, we've got a lot of transition in, in disciplines of between different cultures, one handing off to the next just as well. But it, maybe that's an, an issue. And maybe perhaps if you've got these other cultures involved, are they perhaps translating some of the songs into their own style and, and language? But uh, it's always interesting to see how professionalism uh, and uh, singer rights owners uh, have an impact on the tradition. And it, it, to a certain extent, there's a professional feeling that, that, that one gets as an ordinary person that they might be not wanting to be, be embarrassed to sing in front of uh, professionals. So how is, how is the dynamic between professional and, and ordinary person? And has, have you run out of wood or what? There you go. Do you want to uh, unmeet yourself, Margaret? If you want to I didn't say that they had stopped singing songs. I said that the percentage, probably the general percentage of old songs is, is probably less than it was. I mean, you can go to the festival luncheon and hear, you know, student, you know, a student singing Andrew Lloyd Webber, but, but, the, but the evening concerts are still more um, folk song oriented. Um, there is kind of a tiered system and, but this is largely what Susan has chosen to do. There have been some featured singers each night who, you know, get paid a certain amount and then the um, local singers are paid less, if anything. Um, so there is, you know, but again, each director has put their own 
stamp on the festival and and that it's kind of their thing so this i don't think that i don't think that the lo local singers are are embarrassed at all um as to uh translation that's a very interesting question um alan kelly would translate um uh french songs um into english or english into french um but I am not aware, in terms of lumbering, I would say the tradition is, I don't know about moribund. The, 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 the area, there's a, quite a high unemployment rate and the area is trying to reinvent itself as a retirement community. So, um, so the old, I mean, there were pulp mills that are basically defunct now. Um, and, and as I said, the, um, unemployment is, is, is quite high. Can I, can I just butt in, can I just butt in there and say one last question from Lisa, cause she's been had, had her hand up for a while, but then we're running out of time. So Lisa, Lisa now. Um, yeah, just a sec, just a minute. Are you there? Is anybody there? Lisa, Lisa, you've muted yourself. Unmute yourself. Uh -huh. Okay, I'm there you mute. go. Now you're fine. I wrote a song in the early 1970s in res uh, about the Miramichi Festival when a group of folk revival traditionalists from New York went up to see it and came out in the New York Pinewoods newsletter with a very negative review about the festival saying, we went expecting to hear the old traditional songs, but we weren't hearing very many of them anymore. We heard more popular songs. The song singer songwriters hadn't invaded, uh, but whatever they were right, uh, the reviewer wasn't very discriminating about what he wrote, what she wrote. But it was enough to, but she also talked about the control, the struggle for control that the people running the festival at that time, and I'd say it was probably about 1971, 72, were trying to maintain over the nature of the evening concert performances. And in the meantime, I was rather angry at the reviewer and trying to gain attention in the local folk music community. So I wrote the satirical song that I presented at the next concert sing that they had and it's sort of gone into tradition. And I just would like to conclude, because I think it's very, with perhaps just two verses from it to show you the kind of tensions that the ricocheting tensions that, uh, that I was hearing about from further away. Uh, I'll just take the last two verses of the song. The master of ceremonies rose to embrace her, whispered so softly, oh, Addie, my dear, Shape up or ship out and take your songs with you. It ain't what the audience came for to hear. You're known for your versions of Barbary Allen or give us a tune like the green willow tree. Oh, I see what you mean, replied Addie undaunted and burst out with a chorus of Addie McCree. You know, this was more than the audience could stomach. They rose in their chairs and began to resist some stormed the stage to smother the singer who swiftly was felled by a folk lover's fist. I cannot describe all the blood and destruction, the work of a crowd like in its folk music pure, and it just goes to show for traditional music. You can't put your trust in the folk anymore. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa. And we're going to have to call it a day an afternoon because I'm sure you have other things to do. Thank Could I you. just respond really quickly? Yes, all right, Marge. Um, Lisa, as I told you before, that doesn't ad accurately reflect what happened at the festival. I um, <laughs> but, but certainly after Louise's death, um, the, those strictures about what constituted a folk song um, were less, and it is true that when Maisie ran the festival, um, control sort of got lost, and there, there were a couple of um, years that were sort of difficult. But the audience 
probably also also enjoyed, you know, Victorian uh, parlor songs or Irish, you know, there's a dear old spot in Ireland. So, so, so it is true that that those strictures that Louise had kind of went by the boards after her death, but it, it is not true that the audience rebelled. Maybe, maybe the outsiders okay. who came to view the festival, um, <coughs> you know, you know, um, were, were disappointed, but it, it just doesn't really reflect what the realities at the festival. It did, it did diminish the uh, pilgrimages that traddies in search of old ballads, which perhaps were never the essence of the Miramichi festival in its first place. It, it, we didn't, it, pilgrimages of those people sort of stopped or halted or trickled until- That's probably true. Yeah. Okay, folks, thank you very much. <laughs> I always get told off for letting these things go on too long. See what happens when I try to stop you, you'll carry on anyway. Thank you indeed for um, joining us this afternoon, and especially thank you to Marge and Peter for two really good papers. But don't forget, we're back in a fortnight's time, 9th of August, when we've got four of our members giving papers. And if you want first dibs on the tickets, join the traditional song forum at tradsong.org. Thanks very much. Goodbye, everybody. Bye.